everyone and we're alive. Namaste everybody. Thank you so much for joining the light side today. Today I am so excited to welcome Shannon Connell to the show. I was a student of hers in a couple of yoga classes that we took. I started stalking her because I loved the level of spirituality and evolution and all of the things that we're going to be talking about today. She brings that to her yoga class. And that was the thing that first got me super excited. And I just needed to learn more from Shannon. And I'm happy and so excited to tell you that she has a book that has come out and we're going to be talking about the book today. And it's, it's, um, all about the alchemy of yoga, a psychology akin to magic. And it is absolutely incredible. So Shannon, hello, my love. Hey, everyone. Thank you, Danny. Yes, girl. Yes. And now I know you as a yoga teacher, but I do know that you have much, you have a lot of things going on and a lot of things that you've done. So if you don't mind just giving everybody a little bit of a background about your, your background. Sure. Um, you know, I think yoga encompasses just everything. It's not necessarily something we do. It's a state of consciousness, a state of being. So, I mean, yoga is kind of definitely the umbrella of everything I've done, but I also am a licensed psychotherapist and a Yusui Karuna Reiki master teacher, which to me are just other levels of yoga. Yeah. But yeah, yoga is something that has inspired me ever since I was a little girl and helped me love myself, helped me get to know myself and just keeps me grounded as we are consistently moving through change. <laughs> yes, girl. And tell me, so if you don't mind telling everybody like a little bit of your, how you got into yoga when you were young. Sure. Um, well, it's all in the book, so I'm going to leave some of it a little mysterious, but awesome. I found yoga as a young girl, and it saved my life. It saved my life. I think we all, if we get deep enough into the practice, can agree that it inspires those shifts in perspective, and that's the alchemy process of it. You know, we can... I found yoga where I didn't really like myself at the time. I had low self-esteem. I was experiencing a lot of challenges. And there was something about the practice that helped me connect to myself beyond, beyond the contents of my mind, beyond what I thought about my body, beyond, I don't know, there was just, there was a solace. There was a refuge that I found through the practice. It cultivated a new state of being, a new perspective. and. I believe that's magic. I believe that the process of yoga can create those shifts of perspective, which is magic. But for me, it's about, it's important to like the company you keep. Yeah. Right? And when I was younger, I didn't necessarily like the company I was keeping. I was very influenced by um, the world around me, the culture around me, society, very empathic, very. Um, unable to discern the energy that was around me versus the energy that was within me. And yoga helped me find that discernment and helped me on the journey of figuring out who I am. And sometimes on that journey of figuring out who we are, we're going to be guided by what we're not. You know, the challenges in life, the relationships that hurt us or whatever, sometimes these things guide us towards what we really are. So oh, I get so into more detail in the book, um, but my life has definitely been challenging, but challenging for the reason of setting me free. Mm -hmm. And am I completely free of heartbreak or challenge? No, but I have a more grounded approach and perspective of it because of, because of yoga. Ah, oh, that's so beautiful. And I love, uh, okay, so you started training at a very young age for yoga. I think you, you told me that before you were a dancer first and then yoga came into your life and just helped you switch your perspective and just saved you. Um, and I, I remember you telling me it helped your posture, um, yeah. and things like that too. Um, and who like, so, and I don't know if this is like for the book, but like your teachers, like who, like who are some of your most influential teachers? Yeah. Um, first my parents, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, we're in relationship to everything. All life communicates. So yeah. nature has been a big teacher, water, fire, um, air, everything communicates. So I started out um, 
you know, I, I, I'm an experiential educator. That's how I learn best. And yoga is, and we cultivate an experience, connecting the breath, the body, the movement, and then focusing the mind so we can move beyond all of that and our identification with all of that and settle into something that is actually really real. But yeah, I, David Life, Sharon Gannon, founders of Jiva Mukti Yoga, Libby Mathis, uh, she studied with Krishnamacharya in India, um, Iyengar. Um, Iyengar, it, it's in the book, was really a big pivotal practice for me in helping to heal um, scoliosis in my spine. I actually have in the, a lot of uh, references to, to my yoga teachers all throughout the book. Um, it's a lineage, you know, we pass it on to one another. So um, the process of yoga heals and prepares our nervous system to just receive, receive ourselves, our true selves. Yes. So the book gets a lot into um, psychology and the nervous system. Mm. Oh my gosh. So exciting. So just for everybody who's listening, and I don't even really know the distinction between different types of yoga. So like Iyengar and Jiva Mukti, are these very different or it like, is that different than a vinyasa class or a Nashtanga class? I think it's all very confusing. Yoga is okay. yoga. Yeah. But we branded it here in America, just but it's helpful to have those brands so students can kind of know, okay, am I going to yin? Am I going to restorative? Hot? Is there going to be heat? It's kind of creates some support knowing what you're getting into. Yeah. Um, but traditionally, yoga was between the student and the teacher and helped to balance that person's own disposition. So certain styles of yoga are going to benefit your nervous system, your body. You know, if you're my yoga teachers always told me if you're anxious, practice uh, more sattvic practices like yin or like restorative, which is going to create challenge. Or if you're feeling lazy, to get the vinyasa going, to get the energy up. Personally, vinyasa is my favorite. Why? Because I love the flow. There's something about the moving meditation and the metaphors that exist in the practices are so beautiful. There's so much art, so much metaphor to the vinyasa practice. Um, moving through change of form, we literally change the form of our body with each breath. And what we practice unconsciously or consciously is evolving through change, releasing our resistance to change. And right now we're all being asked to change at a really global level and um, for me I'm finding the practice of vinyasa the practice of pranayama to be the most helpful in helping me stay in the consciousness of yoga mm. that's amazing and so how would you define yoga uh union uh union to your higher self union to the spirit within union to god and I, I, I say God, um, free of any doctrine, um, free of any um, understanding of what I was kind of trained God to be. Um, everyone's going to go direct. We have our own relationship to our higher selves. And we don't have to go through a priest, a rabbi, or someone else to have that relationship. Yoga creates a direct link to have that relationship within ourselves. So it's very personal when I say that name, it's a name and there's many names. So um, please know that effect comes up again in this conversation that uh, you can call it consciousness, you can call it spirit, you can call it whatever you want to call it. That's your own personal relationship with whatever it is in that mysterious force beyond. But yoga connects us to that. Mm. Oh, thank you for that description. That was so good. And I agree with you 100%. Um, and I love that you distinguish the God word because some people really like freak out with it. And some people just have this other like understanding that it's like all, oh, it's everything. It's whatever your personal connection is. So I'm really glad that you distinguish that for us. Thank you. So let's start getting into the book. Ah, okay. So um, the, I, I was looking through it. There are many chapters. This book is full of amazing information. And 
I'm, I'm, I'm kind of excited to dive in with you because I, I've taken your yoga classes, yes, but I've never had a chance to like talk with you about the eight limbs or um, God or anything like that. So I'm, I'm pretty pumped to start to get into this book a little bit. Um, what's like, what's kind of the first thing that comes up for you as far as like, what, what motivated you to make the book? Well, let's start there. Sure. Um, when I first heard that enlightenment was possible, I was hooked. I wanted to experience it. I know, um, you know, the ancient yogis look a lot different than what I look like. You know, I'm sure you're putting a little bit of pictures up right now, but I'm white, American, and a woman, um, which isn't kind of the traditional. But as soon as I heard of the possibility of freedom, liberation, enlightenment, I was hooked. So I dove into the ancient texts. <sighs> the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads, the sutras. And in this book, I attempt to decode the scriptures to prove the science of yoga. Yoga heals, healed me, saved my life um, on many levels, physiological levels, mental, emotional, spiritual. Um, I think it's a process and a practice that should get validated in our educational and medical communities. And I wanted to bridge the gap of the separation between science and spirituality. I feel like when those two schools of thought merge, we are on the road to evolving. So I actually went back to grad school, became a health psychologist, studied the nervous system, the immune systems, um, to try to prove the process of yoga as a natural way of healing. Our body is incredible and can heal ourselves. I feel like we're doing a lot of disservice in our medical communities, pumping people full of pharmaceuticals, drugs, things like that. Um, you know, maybe we have actually a spiritual crisis. We are not trained in our culture to have the emotional intelligence. Yoga can create a bridge to heal all that. So I talk a lot about that in the book. Um, yeah, there's, you know, yoga isn't something you do. It's a state of being, but the practices of yoga are laid out in all these old ancient texts. And it's not just the physical asana, which is what most of us are experiencing in the yoga studios. So there's a little bit of misconceptions on what yoga is. And in my book, I'm attempting to clear that up. <laughs> oh, I love that. And th I'm, I'm so happy that you're saying, saying that yoga is like a state of mind. It's like a way, it's like a way to be um, versus just the physical postures. I know that that was something that blew my mind during teacher training was just about how many other limbs there are that don't have to do with the physical posture. It has to do with so much more. Um, and that for me was, was a big opener. And cause you know, you, you look on Instagram and you see all these perfect poses and you see, so when you're, when in the way that we're being introduced to yoga now, unfortunately it's like, you know, perfect bodies, perfect clothes, perfect postures, perfect, all these things, but it actually has nothing to do with that. It has to do with so much deeper. Um, and I do feel like our society is missing the whole thing a little bit. So yeah. I agree. Um, I think it's about alignment and it's something yes. to celebrate when we see someone in a healthy, beautiful body with good alignment in a yoga posture. Let's celebrate that right. rather than having anger, jealousy, or fear around it. Yeah. Um, you know, we do the practice to come into alignment with ourselves, with our higher self, with God, with our spirit. And um, it doesn't, it's not about being perfect in a pose. It's just about being. There's, I, I talk about the metaphor of the practice. It's like um, each pose will stimulate a certain organ functioning of the body, open up a different chakra system or nadi system in the metaphysical body. I also talk about the chakras, the nadis, the grantis, all these things in the book. Um, but we are, each pose, we are stimulating the endocrine system. We want to have a healthy nervous system to be able to become receptive to the divine grace of enlightenment. It's not that big of a deal. It's just like turning a light switch on, but it does require shifts in perspective. It does require effort. Um, I remember my yoga teachers saying, do the practices if God is watching. 
you know, so it is kind of beautiful. You know, as a teacher, we get a whole nother different viewpoint of the practice of yoga. We can see someone who is really breaking that first sweat or getting a little flushed in the face. They're moving up an energetic karmic seed through the practice of yoga. We're healing our past through the practice of yoga. We're resolving our relationships in each pose to ourselves, to our moms, our dads, our boyfriends, whatever, we can resolve all karma back to source through the practice of yoga. All it takes is a shift in perspective and the intention and the belief that it is possible. Yes. I feel, if I close my eyes, I feel like I'm in your yoga class. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is so yeah, great. I mean, you don't have to have an able body to do yoga. You don't, I mean, you don't have to, um, yeah, be thin and perfect in your body to do yoga. You, can, you don't have to be young. Uh, so I think that's a mis misconception. And, um, but let's just honor the people that are out there in those beautiful, perfect bodies doing the poses with the joints stacked and um, the great back bends. It's like, mm -hmm. that's, that's incredible. They, they have that experience. You know, nothing lasts forever. No body is going to live forever. We right. just have to keep that in mind and love one another. And I think it's really, really important that we evolve beyond those anger, jealousy, or those places of separation because yoga is actually the union. Yeah. Yeah. And I find that people realize that once they do yoga, like, I think they feel more connected. They feel more united with themselves, with their community, with their world, like they're more present. So when they, they're more united with the present moment so that when they go out in their daily life, they find that they're actually more connected and more um, like to the divine and to everything that's going on. So I think it's almost like, maybe you get into it at first, especially over here in the West, because you think it's going to be a good workout and you think it's going to give you X, Y, and Z. Um, but really it, it starts to work on you from the inside out. It's really, it's really, really cool how it does that. Um, and then you're just, you are in the state of being, or you try to be the whole time. And um, I think that's why keeping up the actual asanas is a good reminder and good, like coming back to that union. Exactly. I mean, we have to become responsible, able to respond in the world around us, able to interact with our environments. We are living now the causes that create the effects of our lives. That's the law of karma, the law of nature. So why not live now the causes to create the effects we desire for our lives? Yoga will bring about mindfulness. And when we're mindful, we're able to maybe take a few deep breaths before we react according to an old karmic imprint or emotional wound. Maybe we, we start to shift our perspective, we start to ground ourselves, and we start to really live our lives to help support one another. And that's, that's the biggest shift for me is sharing yoga. I've been teaching for 20 years and there's so many sacrifices in teaching yoga, mm. you know, uh, the financial risks, uh, all these different things, the, the judgment, because not everyone's going to be in the same state of consciousness when they initially come to the classroom. You might mention, you know, studios, they shun you from saying the word God. It depends on what studio you're, you're at. There's so many um, challenges, but the gifts are beyond all of it. And the biggest thing that uplifts my life is sharing the practice with others. It's, it's a being of service to witnessing those shifts in perspective that happen with other people. And I mentioned it's in the book. I mentioned it in this interview. I was at a place in my life where I did not love myself or even like myself. I was overreactive in relationships, moments. I didn't have that groundedness, that um, sense of love, unconditional forgiveness for myself, for others. And there was something about when I helped to calm the nervous system down and balance it out through the physical practice, the breathing techniques, it started to involve, evolve my interactions with how I lived my life, how I responded in relationships, how I chose to see the world. I, it allowed me the opportunity to cleanse the lens of my perspective. So it wasn't cloudy. The only thing is you have to keep up with the practice to constantly <laughs> clean yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I remember my yoga teachers, David Life and Sharon Gannon, saying that it's a lot about preparing for a very special house guest. 
And let's say that house is our body. It's like if you have a special house guest coming over, you're going to clean the guest room, wash the sheets, maybe buy new towels, go to the grocery store. You're going to prepare yourself for the guest. And that's what we do through the practice of yoga. We prepare our bodies to receive ourselves, our higher selves. So um, I love facilitating that for others. I love being of service in hopefully cultivating that in others. And I think it's the lifeblood of a teacher to go into a classroom and everything sinks. You see all these people breathing, moving, focused, sharing an intention together. Yeah. You don't feel alone in those moments. Even if we don't know each other's names in the studio, we're together. Yeah. Um, and it's almost like being a uh, orchestra conductor <laughs> as, a, as an instructor to facilitate that. That's, that's my greatest joy. Mm. And sometimes, you know, you go into the classroom and people, it's totally off sync. <laughs> and that's okay, too. That's okay, too. It's, uh, you know, it's, yeah. we're, we're everything. The good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful, the synced, the step backs. I mean, I think now what's happening with me in this current pandemic is accepting myself that, hey, maybe I am stepping back a little bit. Maybe things are getting a little sloppy, getting really uncomfortable. Where am I resisting change? How can I just trust that life is trying to free me? How can I shift my perspective and my relationships to change to what's happening in our world right now? And, you know, I think, I think it's a beautiful thing that's happening. We're all being forced to kind of go within to really reevaluate how we're interacting with our world, our environment, one another. And we have this beautiful opportunity to, to shift, to evolve. Yes. So it's kind of the perfect timing for the release of this book. Um, it takes you really deep into uh, the psychology of yoga. Alchemy is a process, you know, traditionally of transforming minerals into gold. And, you know, for me, I think it's more of the state of spirituality is how I kind of try to translate it through the book. You know, we have to purify, we have to change, we have to shift, we have to do all these different chemical things with the physiological body, um, preparing the nervous system. But, you know, there's something really everlasting. There's a legacy that we can leave or share um, once we become really connected with, with the higher intention, with yoga. I saw a chapter in your book or, or a topic was the recipe for yoga. Is there, what is the recipe? <laughs> okay. um, I'm so curious. <laughs> right. Well, I, you can get into it with more detail, but I've learned this through my practice from my yoga teachers. Step one, we have to um, observe. We have to watch ourselves, like separate um, our consciousness from the subconsciousness right? To just kind of really look and listen and feel and see the energy that you're running and then become responsible for the energy you're running. According to yoga, our spine, it's like a satellite and antenna. And we are constantly being fed with all these sources of inspiration, whether it's the media, a TV show, uh, what's happening economically, what's all, all these different things, your culture, your race, your age, um, gender, all these different things influence how we relate to the world around us. Yeah. So first we have to just observe, just get real. When we're really, really real with ourselves, with one another, we're going to be met with love, forgiveness, acceptance, encouragement. Mm. So the first step is observe. And in the yoga scriptures, they describe this point of observation as sakshi. So I talk about Sakshi all throughout the book as well, um, but that would be step one. And then step two would be if what you're seeing isn't something you like, as I mentioned earlier, often on the path of figuring out who we are, we're going to be guided by what we're not. So that bad relationship, that bad job, that bad, you know, experience with finances, whatever, it's, it's guiding us into what we don't want, what we 
don't see ourselves as to help us, um, you know, shift the perspective, which is another step in the recipe of yoga. Okay. So if you don't like what you're observing in your life, we have to change. We have to release our resistance to change. Um, I have worked a lot clinically with uh, adolescents um, that have been sex trafficked or post-suicide attempt. And, you know, it does take a lot to, you know, change anger into acceptance and love. Yeah. Those kinds of things, those major shifts in perspective, um, they're so hard, mm. but they're kind of vital. To see our life coming at us to free us is a great opportunity. To see our challenges just showing us our weaknesses that are waiting to become strengthened. Those yeah. kinds of things can really get us through. We can be an angry, mean, jealous person and then take a shower and with the intention, let the water just wash that energy away and step back into the world as a nice, kind, generous, loving person. I mean, it, it can happen in an instant. That's what magic is. So that's another step. And the other steps you can, you can read the book for, for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> okay, for sure. I love that the first one was observation. That's actually something I use with my clients a lot too, because sometimes they don't realize like even like the self dialogue that's going on in their head, like observe, like what is actually, what are you saying to yourself? And then once you've once you, and sometimes it's good. Like sometimes your life is pretty good and you don't really want to change anything, but observing that and being grateful for it is great. But if you can become the observer, then I feel like you stop like unconsciously just doing things. Like you're more aware of your actions because you're observing them. Absolutely. I mean, I think being conscious in action, thought, word, that's how we drive our own karma. We are driving our own karma, whether we're conscious of it or unconscious of it. So let's become conscious of it. Mm -hmm. Even the like self-doubt thinking, I still experience that. Um, and I believe it's the greatest human tragedy, self-doubt. I learned that from my yoga teachers and it's true. Um, you might have an interaction with someone that leaves you feeling low self-esteem or not good enough or all these different things. And the quicker we can observe that and then shift our perspective, replace it with a more positive affirmation, it's better for the cells of our body. It's better for the organs of our body. Um, I mean, there's a lot of other therapists and healers out there that our thoughts, our emotions, if left unconscious, they can affect the health of our physical body. They can cultivate dis-ease in the flow of our body. So I describe oh, yeah. a lot of this in the book as well, um, the process of, of healing. And I have the experience of it in my physical body too. Um, but I did have to go deep into the emotions that I stuffed away and didn't want to look at. Yoga helped me be strong enough to look at those things, to witness them, and then to shift. Yeah. That's how I was watching uh, this Deepak Chopra thing the other day, and he said something about every cell in your body is eavesdropping on your internal dialogue. And that's kind of like what you were just saying, like whatever internal dialogue is going on, the rest of your cells are, cells are kind of listening and responding to whatever you're saying. And with enough time under tension with that, you create some sort of dis-ease in your body. Um, like, so, so, but you can also go the other way with it too, right? Like you can create it, yes, but you can also uncreate it and in fact heal it in some cases. Absolutely. So cool. I also share in the book, um, I've lived in several like spiritual healing communities. I kind of jump in and out of urban lifestyle and then going into kind of more ashram or healing communities. And um, it, it's been beautiful to observe people heal. I've observed people heal from stage five cancer. I've observed people heal from you know, all these different things. I'm not saying yoga or um, a diet or anything will, you know, heal everybody and everything, every soul, every person is on their own journey. But um, I have witnessed in my own body and um, being friends and next to others that it's possible. 
Amazing. So I have a question and I've never, what is, what is a Jiva Mukti? Jiva Mukti is a Sanskrit word for the individual soul um, finding liberation. So freedom of the individual soul while living. And it, in its own like branding or name tells us the possibility of experiencing enlightenment mm. while we're living in this body. And uh, it's, it's beautiful. Like I mentioned before, it's not limited to any body. Um, we don't have to be the ancient uh, yogis from India to experience enlightenment. We can do it here in America in this fast paced life. We can experience it regardless of our gender, our age, our physical ability and capability in the body doesn't, doesn't matter. It's possible. Um, and the promise is in, in the word Jiva Mukti. And what I love about Sanskrit, it's, um, it's a beautiful language where each syllable, each letter will resonate with a different energy point in your body. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it can, it can help sound can help heal ourselves too. So I talk a lot about the yoga of Nadam in the book as well, which is the yoga of vibration, the yoga of sound. Oh. So, um, but Jiva Mukti is such a beautiful, beautiful word. That's why we practice uh, kirtan and mantra um, to kind of stimulate those different vibrations. That's why in some yoga classes, you begin and end the class with the sound of Om. It's not necessarily meaning much of anything. It's creating a vibration that will pulse through the chakras, break up the grantis, which are blocks to consciousness, and hopefully connect us to yoga. <laughs> So uh, beautiful language. I get into all this great depth science um, in the book. And, you know, it's also important if it doesn't make sense to you now, that's okay. Um, you might read something in the book and be like, I don't know what she's talking about. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. When I was young and studying with my teachers, they told me a lot of things that are now just kind of coming into my awareness 25 years later. <laughs> You know what? I'm sure like your book is probably a lot like um, the Bhagavad Vigita, where it's like when if you read it, 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 different things may hit you at different parts in your life. So it's one of those things where even if you don't understand it right in this moment, when you pick up the book a year down the road, five years, that very thing that you didn't understand could be exactly what you need to hear late today. Um, and, and that's what I feel like looking at your book is just like, there's, there's so much information in there and there's so many different ways to go and so many different lessons to learn that I'm sure you could just open up the book to a page just randomly and just be like, oh, wow, thank you for that lesson today. Like that was amazing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a great book to use in yoga teacher trainings. Um, yes. It can um, go, I, I, it's a great book. I kind of really wrote it for, um, more the scientific people, the people that have more uh, logical ways of thinking um, to try to communicate like, hey, this is a system and it works. It, it is a path. I mean, there's many, many paths. So don't get discouraged. There's no one way to find peace while living or freedom or connection while living. There's so many different ways. But yoga is a very thorough path. And um, it is a science. It is a psychology. One of the gurus in my lineage was actually a brain surgeon and a psychologist. And um, wow. I really resonated with that. And um, it's why I kind of chose to go back to grad school. I mean, yoga, as I said, it saved me. I, I'll take you more into my own personal journey of yoga in the book. Um, which is very intimate, but we all have those intimate shadow sides of ourselves. But um, I wanted to communicate to um, more of the scientific community that, hey, this, this should be acknowledged. This should, should be looked at as a um, preventative medicine, as a potential for healing, um, not just the physiological body, the subconscious the psychology of an individual but the psychology and the energy and the health of our environment our culture and um just reconnecting us on a global scale as as humans and we're in a really beautiful opportunity and space right now as a human 
to, to come together with that, to stop seeing ourselves as separate, to stop um, seeing other beings as separate, um, to start more connecting and living in harmony with nature, with other beings, and um, become responsible for that. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, actions that we need to look at and maybe, maybe shift, try to find alternative, more beneficial um, actions where we can be more in harmony with our planet, other beings. Um, I love that. I love the word harmony. It, harmony with nature just makes me really warm and fuzzy inside. And so it if people wanted to practice that and wanted to get more like in touch with nature and just in touch with themselves and like live in more harmony, would you say the eight limbs is a good place to start or like? Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. cool. And the eight limbs just kind of naturally evolves through the practice of yoga. I mean, the more we get in touch with yoga, the more um, those things just kind of naturally start happening. We want to be more honest. We want to, um, we take be of service we want to do we just we just want to do these things because we start to come to the realization that that is our our nature yes i love the eight limbs like yoga, blew yoga me away a platform for activism it it really is um yeah. you know you share space you get people in the room you connect them to their body their breath and then there's a great opportunity to set off a spark um, to maybe shift the perspective, to turn on the light of consciousness. I mean, it is such a platform for activism. I think if, um, <laughs> I remember my yoga teacher saying that um, right now, you know, government and everyone, they just think we're a bunch of hippies um, practicing an exercise class together, but it's, it's so much more than that. It's a revolution. <laughs> yep. Each individual consciousness that evolves I mean, we are going to be more ac active in our community. We are going to want to um, see healthy practices for our environment. We are going to want to um, interact with nature mm -hmm. and um, respect other beings and animals and entities. Um, yes. it, just, it just naturally uh, evolves. Yeah. And I love the, like, nonviolence. Like, I think that might be my favorite like what, when I heard that the first, what is it, Yama or Niyama? Which one's first? Uh, the Yama. But uh, uh, Sa is, yes, the practice of the nonviolence. So you, we can, you know, even the self-talk, that can yes. be really violent, right? right? If yes. someone puts this down, you're like, oh, man, I don't, I don't like my hair today, or that was a bad haircut, or my skin's broken out, or whatever. Um, those kinds of things are actually... Um, we're, we're being violent towards ourselves, or I'm not good enough, or I need this to be happy, or why does, you know, the comparison, that's actually um, a violation of ahimsa. Yes, comparison, and like judging other people, right? Like, oh, she shouldn't be wearing that, or like just our thoughts even outwardly towards other people can be very violent, and like when you realize what ahimsa is, and you want to practice that, you automatically want to like stop being violent to yourself, stop being violent, like you really start to hone in on this word nonviolence and like what that means in every, and that could be like doing violent things to yourself, right? Like that could be, I don't know if somebody's like drinking excessively or smoking excessively. That's like when you start to really click into like, Oh my God, I'm like actually being violent to myself. You kind of want to act a little bit differently. Yeah. I mean that we're a resonance and it's important to be responsible for our resonance, not just for ourselves, but for all beings everywhere. Yes. So when we can love ourselves, we are showing others that it's possible for them to love themselves. Mm -hmm. So it really is, um, it really is an intense practice to stay present. Yes. And I think it's such a beautiful, understandable way. And even like, like not stealing right? Like a stay or being clean, cleanliness, like the, all of these are like really beautiful ways to be and live your life. And it's not like, you know, super dogmatic or, or like st strict, but it's actually like you want to be this way. Nobody really is telling you this. Like, um, I think it's like a personal practice and personal connection to yourself and to God. And, um, and then eventually you go through the, 
the different limbs of yoga. And of course the asanas are in there, but there are seven others that are not physical. <laughs> and then once the breath practice. So like if you had to pick a favorite limb of yoga, what would it be? Oh, good question. Um, and, and you know, this may, it may change, like depending on what level, what, where we are in our life, like we may really need the niyamas right now, or like a couple of years, we may really need samadhi. Um, samadhi is definitely my favorite. It's yeah. that like, yeah, when I just plug in and I'm connected to my higher self, um, different, I mean, let's think we are experiencing things through the uh, physical bodies and we have senses but what if you know it's absolutely possible that there is a lot more beyond what we can see through the physical eyes through you know and i came into the uh i came into this life very empathic so i had memory um i had imagination i had all these like amazing things that I kind of got trained out of through the educational system, through um, my relationships because it made other people uncomfortable. And yoga brought me back to that. It brought me back to um, those talents and gifts and those um, abilities to see beyond the senses of my physical body. Um, so Samadhi is right now my favorite, um, and my current goal is being able to sustain Samadhi because um, being in the world, the culture, America, um, <laughs> relationships, uh, yeah. Am I able to hold it all the time? No, I step back. Um, but it's the goal, and um, but samadhi, when, when I have those moments of absolute bliss, connection, and unconditional love, unconditional forgiveness, um, there's really no words to describe it. Um, everyone's going to describe it or just have to experience it on their own to know what it is. But that, that has been my absolute, absolute favorite um, experience of yoga. Oh, and that's like the goal, right? It's like in for those people who don't sustain samadhi is more of the the goal and that's uh -huh. where you get into some of the higher higher limbs um i am i mean yeah yeah there are uh, many teachers that have achieved that i talk about um maha samadhi in the book as well which is kind of the final the final uh, conscious leaving of the physical body um I mean, there's a lot of yogis that um, are showing us that it's possible, like uh, living on just breath without food. I mean, there's, there's so many things that are available to us that go beyond um, what we can wrap our minds around. You know, you can go back into the Bible and Jesus's ability to heal. Um, these things are possible we just need to stimulate the mental activity of our imagination mm -hmm. and the possibility of it oh, I love so that. that is my personal goal to hold samadhi um but i still and i'll share in the book i'm still very vulnerable i'm still very vulnerable to having my heart broken in relationships i'm vulnerable to maybe um the judgment of students in a yoga class some people aren't going to resonate with me or like me and um i still have to work through that um does that mean um i'm not a yogi no um am i completely liberated and free um in moments <laughs> but that's the goal and i'm so grateful to have a body where i can ride out and achieve that goal so for me, it's just focusing on my health, my, my well-being, trying to live the practice of yoga um, and share it, create that community. Um, because when we hold each other accountable, when we're together in it, we, we get stronger. Yeah. We're a lot, lot stronger. And it's really interesting that we're all kind of self-isolating right now with um, the COVID pandemic. But um, just, you know, we're maybe we're going within to help shift our perspective so we can start to relate with the world in a new and different way. And I just, 
I think it's perfect timing to release this book to share some of the information that I've been blessed to receive from my yoga teachers um, and decode from the scriptures. Um, what's so beautiful is that there's different perspectives all based on each and every one of us. So um, it just it just sets us up for exciting conversations, exciting exciting things you know yoga um we're all gonna have a different experience with it um but it will bring us together yes. so for people who don't know what samadhi is um it from from my understanding is it total absorption in the present moment like being totally just like free from judgment free from like emotion or if, how would you describe samadhi um, I would say, um, I would describe it as absolute bliss, love, yeah. peace, joy. Yeah. Um, there's really, you know, sometimes words can affect the ac actual essence of something. Um, it, it's just something that needs to be experienced. So I would, you know, practice more mindfulness technique, practice, um, yoga, practice meditation, practice um, just being mindful in everyday activities like taking a shower or preparing your food or, you know, these, these simple things that often we do on autopilot, let just try to shift and become present with it. Yes. Okay. Perfect. And I think this would be a good time to talk about um, like mental health. I saw a little bit of stuff in your book about mental health and about stress. And I know that that's sort of like, that's been a big topic. I feel like in, in the world lately it has been mental health um, and then combating stress. And so like, um, what do you have to say about, about that kind of stuff? Cause I'm sure a lot of people come into your classes and they're stressed out from their day and they're, you know, and people's mental health. And, and you've also dealt with this in a clinical setting. So I'm really curious to know what you have to say about that. Sure. Um, stress kills. <laughs> it affects, um, the relationship of our cells, the organs, everything. And this is, this is the nervous system and why, you know, the ancient scriptures talk about so much the nervous system and how we have to heal it or prepare it for um, enlightenment or being conscious in our life. Um, I went in grad school and studied psychoneuroimmunology, which is a fancy way of saying how stress affects the immune system, um, all systems of the body. Wow. And, and it does. I've experienced it in my own life and healing and um, stress, stress kills. So anything we can do to release stress or reduce it is important. And unfortunately, with, you know, the economic system and um, how we're agreeing to live in the world, um, we're susceptible to a lot of stress. We weren't taught necessarily how to communicate well. We weren't taught um, emotional intelligence. We all are living and agreeing to the system of money. Um, yeah. And, you know, we all have to kind of try to survive. So most people I think are in survival states of consciousness right now um, with the shutdowns. Um, our yoga studios are shut down. Um, how, are, how, as a yoga teacher who lives paycheck to paycheck, are we going to pay the rent and buy food? And, you know, some of these things, it's confusing because food is free. The earth gives us food. So I think we're at a really beautiful um, time in a uh, world to see the challenge presenting us an opportunity to become free of all these external stresses that um, they're cultural, they're societal. Um, most people, for example, think their food comes from the grocery store, but actually it comes from the earth. <laughs> um, so there's all these different things going on that affect our levels of stress. Mm -hmm. Um, and stress is directly correlated with our immune system. Chronic diseases are popping up over the last, you know, 60, 80 years. And then now this surge of infectious disease because our immune systems have been broken down because of diet, lifestyle, um, constantly being in a chronic stress response. So I get really um, kind of 
uh, heady in parts of my books to describe to the reader the physiological process of stress um, and what's happening in the physical body. And my purpose with that is, um, again, to bridge science and spirituality, but also um, our body reveals to us a lot of the secrets of the universe and um, even God. So if you look at what happens in a disease like, for example, cancer, um, the cells start attacking the body. So if energetically where, if we start to shift our perspective and think about where we self-attack ourselves, maybe with low self-esteem and, you know, bad thoughts about not being good enough, these kinds of things, or being a burden, or that can affect how the cells react. Um, there's so many things that can stress us out and guide us to a misconception, like um, getting dumped or um, getting fired or all these different life experiences that happen, but how we perceive it um, is really, really important for our stress levels and, and our health. So I try to describe that and the relationship of stress and our immune system and our health. I mean, we really have a choice um, in our health and not a stress or peace. And yoga is a technique and practice that can help us reduce the chronic stress response, heal the endocrine system, heal the nervous system, heal the immune system so we can better cope with, you know, the stresses that are being presented to us in, in our lives yeah. on a global level as being a human. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. I love this. So oh, there's so much in your book. Um, what do you have like a favorite, if you had like a favorite chapter, do you, or like a favorite topic that you go over, what would it be? Um, right now it's coming out, uh, in my heart and based on what we're experiencing right now is, uh, the section on the resurgence of the Victory Gardens. And, you know, we're kind of experiencing, this is the first time the world has kind of shut down since, uh, you know, I think in the 1930s, what was that called? The uh, things shut down. Um, like and the government, Yeah, the government actually um, was encouraging people to grow their own food, to have community gardens, to grow food in your yard, on the rooftop, in the parks. Um, it was, is actually, you know, I, I think that's a beautiful solution to some of the things we're experiencing. Instead of abandoning our role to protect nature, to honor nature for sustaining our bodies with the best health, um, let's get back to the soil. Let's heal it. Let's get back to growing and cultivating our own food knowing the process it takes rather than buying something at the grocery store, going out to a restaurant and not knowing the impact of who touched it, who made it, what energy were they vibing with in that process. Um, the transportation, the air pollution, all these different things that go into um, how we cultivate the earth and how we're, how are we feeding ourselves? So, um, that's kind of something that's really exciting to me um, right now because, um, you know, I've lived on um, farms, cultivated the earth, and that's been the happiest, the most connected I've ever been with, with my spirit. Yeah. Um, so that's something that's really exciting to me right now, um, that chapter, um, because I feel like it could create, you know, there, there are a lot of community gardens being set up. Um, but there really shouldn't be people that are hungry. Um, food is actually free. It's a gift from nature. Um, we just kind of uh, developed, a, I would say, a toxic relationship to, to nature, thinking we can control it, thinking that we can own the seeds and all these different things that... Um, that uh, you know, humans, we are well aware of um, the problems, you know, and it's up to us to fix them. And a lot of it is ingrained in our, in our culture. And um, I think, yeah, the chapter on the resurgence of the Victory Gardens is just uh, 
an opportunity to, to, to heal those relationships. I love that. I even love the name, like resurgence of the Victory Garden. Like that just sounds like a beautiful place and time. <laughs> oh my gosh. That reminds me of the earth, like the whole, all the stuff that's being reset on the earth, like the smog and the waters and like things are really taking a big deep reset breath. Um, so it's, it's, it's so funny how it's like that's happening on the micro, the macrocosm and the microcosm. Cause now we, we might be, get a chance to get our hands dirty in the Victory Gardens. So. Yeah, I agree. I think it, it's kind of interesting that we're all being asked to, you know, uh, stay home and kind of go within and um, maybe nature's healing right now. There's less transportation happening. There's less, um, maybe the animals are being able to come out and, you know, get into some of the parks and um, have more opportunity to find food. And if we think about what we've done to animals and other beings, um, caging them for their fur, their skin, their meat, maybe kind of getting a taste of our own medicine, being caged in our own homes <laughs> a little bit. But, you know, if, if this gives the opportunity for nature to heal, for other beings to heal, um, I'll gladly take a few months of social isolation for that to happen. I mean, we are in a collective karma, a collective consciousness. And if we all can see and admit our role in creating our own problems, that's a big step that's vital to, to our healing. And um, I also talk about this stuff and it may be a little controversial to some people, but again, it's just a perspective. But I do talk a lot about um, our relationship to nature and animals and um, sustainable development and, you know, just to inspire the critical thinking, you know, no blame, no shame, no guilt. We've all done things. Maybe it'll inspire a different way of being in the world where we can cohabitate with other beings and not enslave them, rape them or um, encage them for our food or for um, the building of a new shopping mall. You know, maybe this whole uh, pandemic can inspire a critical shift where we can where we can evolve. I would love love to see that because humans, you know, once we can kind of um, spend that time with ourselves, we'll we'll come to know that our true self is quite incredible. Yeah. We we kind of are psychologically like brainwashed with commercials and sex and. Um, you know, what's cool, what's not money, all these, all these different things. But is that, is that even real? You, you know, can yeah. we, can we evolve beyond that? And I think, you know, why I'm so passionate about farming and cultivating the earth and um, the practice of yoga is that it really can heal us, not just on an individual level, but um, I believe on an environmental and, and global level as well. That's why I've been teaching for, for 20 years. Man, I wish the whole world could take one of your classes because it is just, a, and you bring like this depth in small doses into your classes. And that, like I said, was like why I was like, oh my God, this is it. I found my guru because <laughs> I, I was so excited because you don't really get a whole lot of that, right? And the reason why I went through teacher training was for some more of this. I want the eight limbs. I want the naughties. I want all of this stuff. Um, so when I find a teacher that's into it and now you have a whole book is like so exciting to me because you're just like, you're the messenger, right? Like you're just tra like all this stuff that you've learned, you're just trickling it and taking it with you and now teaching it to your students and your readers. Um, and it's, it's really is such a blessing, Shannon, to be even, um, well, we, like, we do it in honor of our teachers, you know, right. it's like okay. we do it in honor of the lineage. Um, so how dare I not share it? You know, my, my teachers, um, are still in their bodies and still here and um, teaching and traveling. And I just, um, I admire them so, so much. And then the teachers who taught them, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing to share. It's like, how, how dare I not? Yeah. So um, like I said, in the beginning of the interview, once I heard of the possibility of freedom and enlightenment, I've been, hooked ever since and I just feel so grateful to have found it as a as a girl and um, to still be 
uh, healthy and active in the body to hopefully share it with a lot more people um, while I'm here. It becomes our mission. It, it just teaching yoga, it becomes, it becomes a mission. It's, it's a service. Um, so yeah, I am so excited to share this book with people and, um, I've lived without internet and Wi-Fi my whole adult life. And, um, it's interesting to kind of shift, uh, focus and get more, uh, uh, kind of internet audience. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see how, how it goes. <laughs> Perfect. And now, is there any other glimpse into the book that you want to give everybody um, before we close out the little interview? Like, there, I, there's so much in there, everybody, that, like, it's hard. And I, and I just i am so excited for everybody to get this. But, Shannon, is there anything else that you really wanted to, like, verbally get out right now? Um, thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for um, exploring. Thank you for doing the work to to heal yourself. I mean, you have to be so, so brave to uh, really look, listen, feel, and um, get real with ourselves. And um, we need each other. I, I need you. The world needs you. Um, you doing the work, you doing the practice, it inspires me to do the work, it inspires me to do the practice. Um, and to stay, stay strong, stay on the path. You know, we're all walking alongside one another and just like nature, we can't rush things. Um, but the fact that we're all coming together um, and talking about these things and exploring these things, um, it, it, it helps me. So I just wanna thank, thank all of you guys. Um, thank you. And thank you, Danny. Um, <laughs> yeah, for encouraging me to step into a different platform, getting online and um, doing doing this interview and for being an amazing teacher out there in the world. Shannon, thank you so much. That means a lot. <sighs> okay, so I'm all warm and fuzzy with yoga stuff. Uh, by the way, this, like, I get so excited. Like, I get, when we start talking about the eight limbs and the, d the depth of everything and the seat of a teacher... It's very exciting to me. Um, so where can people find you? Where can they find your book? And I know that you have a couple guided meditations and yoga classes on your website, right? Yeah, um, they're old. They're from about five years ago. Um, as I mentioned, um, it's kind of my first time getting on internet and I have a, you know, I'm kind of trying to heal my own perspective about it to bridge the gap during this time. Um, to kind of keep the teachings going. Um, so bear with me, but you can um, find me through my website, Shannon Connell Health. It's S H A N N O N C O N N E L L health.com. It's my website. You'll find yoga videos. Um, under the blog section, there is a the first blog is on book release and contact. You can contact me through the website or you can email me also shannonconnellhealth at gmail.com. And you can also follow me and connect with me on Instagram and that's at shannonconnellhealth as well. Um, the book is PDF, but uh, it's pretty cool. You can click on a chapter and go straight there. Um, it has uh, yet to be kind of in a, uh, paper back or hardcover, but, um, you know, that's kind of the goal. It just felt like the perfect time to release it. So I'm asking for, um, $20 for the book. Um, I'll send you the PDF and then I can either get Venmo or PayPal or old school, just get mailed a check. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just excited to get it out. And, um, yeah, I, I do believe that we are the highest forms of technology. So um, just kind of bear with me as I update things and um, educate myself on technology, like things like Zooming and um, getting a, a direct link to buy the book via my website. Um, so those are things that uh, I got to commit to working on. <laughs> 
Right, but for right now, people can email you, they can find your website, and I'll put all of the links in the description. So it's really just as easy as clicking to your website and they can find you. Because um, guys, this book is amazing and I'm so excited for you to read it and to learn and to just maybe switch your perspective, plant some seeds. And we have a lot of downtime right now. Like why not dive a little deeper into yourself, into the universe, into yoga? Okay. Well, Shannon, thank you so, so, so much for coming on the show. Um, it's a, it's so great to hear your voice and to just be connected with you in this time. Um, and everybody else, thank you so, so, so much for listening and, um, please check out Shannon's book. You will not be disappointed. Um, and I guess that's all we have everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Peace, love, namaste, and I will see you on the next episode. Peace.